hospital that promote healthy living, that promote injury-free lifestyles. So from a trauma perspective, one of the things that we work on, for example, is we work on child safety. So we work on car seat initiatives. We have programs for children like bike safety and helmet safety. And the other thing that we tend to work on more and more and more as our population is aging is injury prevention for the elder population. And our number one trauma, and you can go to any trauma center in the United States or Canada or worldwide, is elder trauma, elder falls. So this became somewhat of a passion of mine in the last five years starting this job and realizing that at any time during the day, I'll get probably within a 24 hour time frame, I will get a page three, four times that someone has fallen. And elders, when they fall, we tend to treat them as a true trauma for many reasons. Our number one reason is that very often elders are on a blood thinner and falling on a blood thinner and striking your head can be catastrophic. So when we look at elders and we hospitalize them, we treat them very differently than we would a 20 year old who fell down just simply because of that blood thinner, but also the injuries can be more severe. So I'm sure most people are very familiar with falling and breaking a hip. And that is probably our number one injury when we look at that. Or our second injury is a head injury. It could be an intracranial bleed or a simple concussion. So when I got involved with this, it was very much an infant program here. And we built it so that we can reach out to the community at any time. We have videos such as this. We have Zoom meetings. I Zoom with probably about four to five senior centers in the region. And one of the roles that I have is I'm on the Southwestern Connecticut Agency on Aging. I'm on the board of directors. And again, I learn a lot from them, but I also am able to share because of that group as well. So today they invited me on to talk about practical falls, or sorry, preventing falls, practical strategies for home. So I'm not going to, you know, really get into too much of the home environment, what you can do to alter the home environment. I will speak on it, but I'm going to talk about preventing falls for you, strategies, personal strategies. And again, at any time, if anyone has any questions, please just raise your hand or just chat up. I'm, I'm absolutely fine if people want to have me stop and, and clarify something. So one of the questions that, uh, it's actually not a question, one of the comments that I get from a lot of my patients, and, and by the way, I am an RN and I'm also a nurse practitioner student, so I'm very involved at the patient level as well. I get this all the time. Well, you know what, as I've grown older, I've expected to fall down. And it always shocks me to hear that because falls are preventable and it is not a natural course of aging. And when I meet with seniors face-to-face -face before COVID or even now on telehealth or via Zoom, I always ask the group to participate. And if anyone has a story that they would love to share or, and even if you're nervous of sharing, generally when I have a crowd of people, I'll ask, have you had a fall? And out of 12 to 15 people, you might get one person. And as that first person shares, yes, I've fallen, more and more people feel a little bit safer to share that they've had a fall. And very often they're afraid of admitting they had a fall for various reasons. I've heard patients say to me, well, if I tell my doctor that I fall, then I'm worried that I'm, I'm going to be put in a nursing home or they'll think I'm weak or they'll think there's something wrong with me. And so there's this lack of sharing that goes on. And when more and more people share what's happened, I do find that more solutions can be generated by the group. Because so, so for example, I had a gentleman who was complaining about tripping on the sidewalk and it happened to be I think it was actually in Greenwich where he fell on a sidewalk that had heaved up. And there were several members in the group that said, wait a minute, if you where was this? And we generated a solution to contact the town to say, did you know in this part of the town, these sidewalks have been in disrepair for years. And we were actually able to change things because people did speak up. We also asked patients if you've had a injury from that fall and what was the injury? And we talk about worries about falling. 
And do people feel unsteady when they're standing or walking? When they did a study back in the early 90s, and this is true to today, in case of anybody's wondering if this is current evidence or not, the number one cause of falling, believe it or not, is actually fear of falling. And that's because people have this lifelong fear after one fall, or they've seen their brother or sister or wife, spouse fall, then all of a sudden they say, well, wait a minute, I'm, 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 more, I'm going to fall too. And the more fearful we become, the greater the risk of fall. Because what we do is we stop moving. We stop moving around. And once we stop moving around, we know this. And we do this to patients in the hospital all the time. We put them in a bed, we say, you're here to rest. And then two days later, they're weaker than kittens trying to get out of bed. Because the more you are sedate, the weaker you become. And that's true with anything. So when we are weak or when we do not move, we fall more because we've been sitting in the chair. I often refer to, to the chairs in the house when we do home visits as a nest. We get ourselves very comfortable in our little nest and we have our remote, we've got our phone, we've got our electronic devices if we have them, we have our book, our cup of tea, our cup of coffee, our drink, and we stay there. And we've had a number of patients that share I was in the chair for three hours and then when I finally got up, I couldn't, I couldn't maintain my balance and off I went. And so that fear makes us even more inactive. It makes the person feel alone and we definitely know this from research and we know this just from talking to people that it definitely causes depression as well. So some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today are our physical risk factors environmental risk factors. When you sign on to this, you think, well, practical strategies for staying at home, I wanna learn more about my home. Those are our environmental risk factors. What can we do at home to change that may make us safer in the future? So I'm going to move on with the medical or the physical factors, which is the first bullet here. So I, when I go out and I do these speeches or talks or just peer-to-peer -peer interaction, my number one thing that I speak to seniors about is dehydration. In an adult, water is 50% of our body weight. In a child, it's 75, but in an adult, it's 50% of our body weight. Now think, think about it. If we don't have water, or we don't have the adequate amount of water, then we're at risk for things like kidney stones. And as we've grown older, we have more and more patients developing kidney stones because it is a concentration of our elements in our body that leads to kidney stone. I've read highlighted infections because when we are flushing through our body, we're flushing through bacteria and that includes our mouth, for example. Seniors are more predisposed to pneumonia, for example. And one of the things that happens is that we get bacteria in our mouth and if we're not washing through, we're not flushing through the bacteria in our mouth, then that bacteria sits there, moves here, and then moves into the lungs as well. And that's one of the reasons for infection. So I'm not saying that's the only reason, but it's definitely one of the things that we have to be mindful of. Stroke, for example, and heart attacks. When we're dehydrated, we're more predisposed to throwing a blood clot. Increasing our water. They did a really, really cool study in Japan of patients, or not patients, I refer to people as patients, but the, the general public they increase their water by 500 mils. So that's roughly two cups of water, two additional water bottles a day, or actually, sorry, 500 mils is a two liters, sorry, or one liter rather. So they increased their water. And what they noticed was a few things. Number one was it suppressed the heat loss. So when we grow older, we lose a lot of body fat. We lose our brown fat, which holds heat in. And when, I'm in the kitchen, for example, I might be hotter than someone else sitting in the living room. And I know that my older relatives are often cooler than I am because they don't have the ability to hold on to heat. And water actually helps you hold on to your heat much, much better than being dehydrated. We also know that it decreases recurrent urinary tract infections. And when we look at one of the number one infections that elders present with, so I'll give you an example. I could be called to the trauma room in about a half an hour. It might be a 70 some year old male or female that's fallen. And we don't really have a clear reason why they fell. 
So when we do what we call it a, a bit of a dive down to figure out what's going on, we often discover that it's a urinary tract infection. And when we get a urinary tract infection, we don't present like we did 30, 40 years ago. We don't have that feeling of, oh, I've got some burning when I pee or it hurts when I pee. Very often, those responses as we grow older are, are not there. So we don't even know that we have a urinary tract infection. And by increasing our water, again, we flush that bacteria out and we keep our kidneys functioning at the level they need to be functioning at. It decreases blood pressure. So if I had to pull a dozen seniors in a room, I would say 10, maybe nine, eight, around that, would admit, yes, I'm on a blood pressure pill. I've been on it for years. I've been taking this pill for years and it works. The more water you have, the more it actually decreases your blood pressure because it dilutes those waste materials. And over time, we also know that it decreases our blood sugar. It doesn't necessarily decrease our fasting blood sugar, which is the first sugar in the morning before you've eaten, you've fasted, but it, over time, they've noticed that it actually decreases the glucose level in the body. So dehydration in itself, I could probably spend a whole lecture just on dehydration. And what's interesting is that, you know, our generations have changed. When I do these talks, I work with Fairfield University nursing students, and the nursing students all carry these giant water bottles into the room. And I notice that a lot of the participants will have a glass that we've provided them, but they don't necessarily carry their own water bottle. And I think generation-wise, we're learning more and more that water is so much more essential than what we learned from 40 years ago, which is not something that we necessarily thought about. But we are learning, so that's the good thing. The other thing that we have, and I mentioned this before, is the urinary tract infection, but we also get pneumonia. As we grow older, we develop more what we call comorbid conditions. And I'm sure everyone is very familiar with this right now, given COVID, because we know that people that get COVID, for example, are worsened if they have diabetes, uh, COPD, if they're overweight, for example, or high blood pressure. But the two, COPD and diabetes, are comorbid condition, conditions that predispose or make us more likely to have an infection. Normal body responses are different in an adult, in an older adult. Our fever response is not there. So as a 40-year-old, you could take someone's temp and it will be, let's say, 101. And you may take that same temp in an older person with the same infection, and they'll actually have no fever. And that again is a change that we expect when we age. We have a weaker vaccine response. So when you get your vaccine for influenza, they'll often give you what I call the, the, the giant meal size vaccine because you need more of it or you need a better version of it because you don't respond to vaccines the way that a 40 year old would. And I know this question will come up, is that the same with COVID? They've not seen that with COVID primarily because they haven't studied a lot of older people, but they haven't seen that the elder person has a weaker vaccine response. I think there's a question here. So let me just, oh, Gina wants the questions answered at the end. So we will go to the end. So we have a weaker vaccine response. We also have chronic health issues, as I said, COPD. And in terms of respiratory health, because our muscles actually get smaller, what we call atrophy as we get older, we have a weaker response to a cough. So when we had this robust cough in our 30s, 40s, 20s, our cough becomes weaker. So you can't cough up what I call the garbage that's down there. So it's very difficult to do that. Urinary symptoms, we have the reduced ability to hold urine and we have a decreased flow. And given that, it predisposes us to urinary tract infections our skin becomes more predisposed to infections. And a lot of times that has a lot to do with malnutrition. So one of the questions that I get a lot is, you know, how do I mitigate or how do I stop myself becoming malnourished? I always encourage first that you visit your primary care physician or provider to determine where your body status is before you make the decision to go and buy a nutrient or a supplement over the counter. 
And one of the questions that we get asked a lot right now is what about vitamin D? I'm taking extra vitamin D because I read online or my daughter or my son, or even you've learned through just having conversations that vitamin D is protective for COVID. We do know that vitamin D is very protective for respiratory conditions. We do know that, that's evidence that's been shared. And the other thing that we also know is that vitamin D is often very low or low as we get older. So the older we grow, the more our vitamin D levels go down. The best thing you can do is ask your physician to draw your blood for a vitamin D level. And that will give us an idea. Anything under 30, you need a supplement. 30 and above, you're pretty much taken care of. And so based on that, they will prescribe you either a, what I call the big dose of vitamin D, or you can take an over-counter supplement of vitamin D. It's completely up to you and your provider. But that malnutrition, that vitamin D does improve. And as well, it's very important. And, and I think this is a lot of common sense that people are very aware of. You know, you eat your three meals a day. You have your two snacks, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. And that helps you be, from becoming malnourished. Smaller meals are often much better than, oh, I had my big meal at lunch. Smaller meals are, are better for us in general, and it keeps us with the energy that we need throughout the day. And I, I'm going to touch on this, but alcohol consumption actually decreases our elements in our bodies. So if you're having three to four drinks in the evening, that may not be the best for you in terms of your nutrition. So moving on to the next slide, sorry. I, I know that this is not a topic that was needed for today, and I just briefly touch on uh, in terms of medical factors that affect our risks for falling. Of course, we do have a certain population that has dementia or altered thought processes, and that makes them more predisposed to fall as well. In terms of depression, I do want to touch on this because this is definitely something, these are controllable. Remember, everything I say here is controllable. And because we have these risk factors of if you're dehydrated, you're going to fall more because you're going to feel dizzy. But think about being depressed as well. An untreated depression, it's interesting, there's a number of articles that talk about depression without sadness. And when we do studies on elders, we often see elders depressed, but not sad. And it's very different from a younger person manifesting their depression in front of their physician. They'll often say I'm very sad. But interestingly enough, sadness is not something that generally comes up. We know that depression is also associated with illnesses. They've done huge studies on people that have had cardiac disease and they've had to have open heart surgery. And what's happened to them over time in terms of their depression. And we know that treating depression is so, so, so important in this population because very often people are, like as I said before, they're in bed a lot and they feel like, well, what, what's it worth? I, I'm, I'm done anyway. And so if you have a, had a recent illness, whether it be COVID-19 or a stroke or a heart attack, and you feel down, that's not normal. We don't want people to be depressed. And very often I hear, well, that's normal as I grow older. No, it's not. Of one to 5% of seniors over the age of 65 are definitely demonstrating depression. Now, given the events of the last week or even just the last year, we're having more and more patients present with sleeplessness. I can't sleep. I'm, I'm, I'm agitated, I don't feel rested in the morning. And if you feel these symptoms, you know, your sleeplessness, you're very tired, and you just can't move around, then that is depression or could be depression. I don't wanna diagnose you, but these are the things that happen when we're depressed. We also demonstrate poor memory and we put it down to, well, I'm getting older, or I, maybe I have Alzheimer's, or maybe I'm demented. No, that could be depression that we need to look at in the practice. Poor concentration is another factor or another symptom. So I'm going to give you an example here of something depressive that it, it, you know, it happened in my husband and I'm sure his ears are burning as I say this, but said to me, depressed, my husband's 57, not sleeping, 
poor memory, poor concentration. And this happened kind of over time and definitely very snippy at home and, and really had no cause for it. He just said, well, I've never been depressed before and I've never seen my husband depressed, not one minute. And you know, I've been married 31 years, not one minute has this man been down. So we knew there was something up. And when we got him into the physician and they did the blood work, they realized that his vitamin D level was nine. Now, if you mentioned a few minutes ago, vitamin D levels are normally 30. So that was untreated depression related to something else. And again, these are things that happen whether you are out in the sun all day or not. It is, can be a very genetic disposition, but there's something like 80% of the population are vitamin D deficient. And I know I've gone back to vitamin D, but it's just one of those things that we notice with depression. How do we address it? So it's one thing to say, yes, I've got it. Yes, I've got all those symptoms recently, but what do you want me to do about it? Well, you know, I think right now we're in the advantage that we have this telehealth that's popped up in the last year. And I think this should have been around for 10 years previous, but we do have the advantage of having these types of meetings face to face, even though we're not necessarily in the same room, speaking about it with a physician or a counselor, they've, I can't give you the statistic, but it's something like 50% of the population that are demonstrating depression do really well with telehealth. So another thing that I think is very interesting is peer-to-peer -peer interactions. If you have the ability to get into a Zoom meeting, if you have the ability to participate in an exercise class of any sort at all, then I encourage it 300% because you will notice coming home that, or even getting off the call, that that depression has lessened. One of the things that I think is very important is acknowledging what's going on. We as a population ignore because it's easy to ignore the bad and we want to keep moving, we want to be positive. Sometimes you need to say, I don't feel good. I need to do something about this. And that is actually addressing that depressive state that helps you move from it. And you know, as women, I'm not sure how many women are on the call, but I will address women, as our estrogen stores, stores decline, you know, premenopausal, menopausal, postmenopausal, we become more depressed because estrogen helps serotonin and that's why. And a lot of people don't realize that as well. It's very hard to tell someone to go to sleep when they're not sleeping and there are issues with their sleep. I would recommend that you look at your medications. Some of your medications may be keeping you up. Another thing is you might try some melatonin, again, on the advice of your physician or your primary care prov provider. And you may try not napping during the day. I don't know if that helps people with their mood, but I think that napping too much during the day and being up all night and messing up that circadian rhythm certainly isn't helping our depressed state of people out there. As I mentioned, look at your medications and say to yourself, well, what am I taking here? If you are already taking a sleep aid and it's not helping you sleep, but you feel groggy and drugged, that's not good either. I'll be honest with you, medications for sleep, we try to get populations of over 65 and over completely off them for a lot of reasons. Number one, that medication can make you more predisposed to falling because you're groggy, you're drowsy, and your gait is off. So have a look at your medications, go to your pharmacist, ask them about your medications, talk to your physician, talk to your nurse practitioners and say, can you run through my medications? Will any of the medications make me feel sleepy? Are they making me feel more depressed? And the number one thing that people can do is exercise. So I think, you know, I think that's a very common sense thing. Oh, sure. Exercise. And you tell me to exercise, but there's not a lot I can do about that. I I'm, I'm chair bound, I'm house bound, what do I do? And I will address that as we move forward. As I said earlier, medication, look at your medical factors. Pain can definitely, definitely affect our ability to move, whether it be acute or chronic. And I think one of the issues that's come out, and it seems to be a little bit on the back burner given COVID, is that for years, we've been given way too many pain medications. You know, you have a little pain in your back, give them oxycontin. It's incredible how this opioid epidemic has affected age 65 years and older. 
And many of them are feeling the effects of withdrawal because they've been on these chronic pain medications for years. And now all of a sudden they've been told you don't deserve them, you, you, it, there's a crisis. Well, how on earth can pain go away if we don't address it? And if you are in pain, again, you stop moving, you become you know, chair bound, and whether it be acute or chronic, pain will lead to a fall eventually. Heart racing, I think a lot of people are in atrial fibrillation nowadays. And again, if you feel that your heart is racing above 100, and even if you are on a medication, we look at 100 as a pretty high heart rate for someone over the age of 65. So if you came in and I looked at your vitals during a trauma and I saw that your heart rate was a little too fast, I'd wonder what else is going on. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a 40 year old, but I'm an elder person. I'm first thing I look at is, wait, why is that pain? Why is that pulse too high? And that can lead to something as well. Lower extremity weaknesses. I've done a number of these sessions and I get a lot of questions about cramping, uh, calf cramping, whether it be lower leg or upper leg, very often you are dehydrated. I'm gonna go right back to the water thing again. Very often people need that extra water because they're dehydrated and that's why they're cramping. Other reasons are, it could be that you are deconditioned, you might be not as flexible as you used to be, or your electrolytes might be out of balance. So again, having someone do a panel of electrolytes such as magnesium or calcium to have a wee look at those factors to see if in fact you're a little low and if we can help you with that. We have low extremity numbness as well as you know arthritis and neuropathy and what can I do about that? Again, there's a number of things that we can do to mitigate arthritis from progressing or to mitigate or slow down neuropathy from progressing. And I, I often, you know, when I say the word neuropathy, people just go, I know what that is. But neuropathy is essentially this. When you think of um, an electrical wire and the, and the wires have that beautiful coating on the end of it and it prevents someone from getting electrocuted or getting a shock. But neuropathy is essentially that coating degrading from our nerve endings. So if you were to touch it, it's like, ugh, like this. It's that sharp feeling where you have to pull back. That's neuropathy essentially is we're losing that little coating that covers our nerve endings that keeps us protected from pain or from feeling that numbness. So just to give you an idea of what neuropathy and what we do for it, often we can give things like gabapentin for neuropathy, exercise again. These are some of the things that I do recommend that people do to help with arthritic pain, to help with neuropathy. Believe it or not, this is a difficult one to ask of people because when I got to get up in the morning, I need to go to the ladies room. I don't want to sit and dangle my legs at the side of the bed for five minutes, but we ask people to do that to normalize their blood pressure because very often if we get up too fast, we get that dizzy woo woo feeling and down you go and dangling at the side of the bed will help your blood pressure normalize but will also help the feeling in your limbs come back help with the neuropathy some arthritis forms are worse in the morning get yourself moving so that when you get out of bed you're not walking on two bricks you have a little bit more flexibility so that helps dangling helps that neuropathy and helps with the arthritic pain this is a tough one, relocating your bed closer to the bathroom. That's an idea on the web that I'm a little mixed about because if someone asked me today to move my bed, I'd probably have a few words for them. But these are just ideas, remember. Personal alarms. I know a number of people have them and I also a number of people don't use them. And it could be in the form of the necklace that we wear where you press the button or a watch. You know, the Apple watches that I have here have various fall detection apps that you can buy they are you need to purchase them but what's really interesting of this new technology and it's not apple owned but it's an app within there if you do have the watch it actually detects high velocity and low velocity falls so in other words if i fell suddenly from a you know high height here and i fell my watch will detect there might be something wrong based on the way i fell and it was an interesting story not that long ago, probably about a year ago, a gentleman who was biking. I don't know how he ended up in the ditch beside the road, but I think he broke ribs and a collarbone and his watch detected a fall, notified his son, 
and notified 911 all in one. So the man was not saved, but he was saved, but EMS was able to find him based on his GPS location. Bedside commodes are a great idea for those of you that have that limited mobility in the morning. And of course, assistive, assistive devices, walkers and canes. I love them and I hate them at the same time. Because I'll be honest with you, a lot of my patients fell because they tripped over their walker or their cane. So it can be a blessing in disguise, but you have to be careful. If you don't need them, then I wouldn't necessarily rely on something that can help you fall as well. When we look at home modifications, again, you know, the, the title might be mis misleading, but in terms of C or sheet D-shaped handles in the kitchen, and in this corner here, you'll see that C-shaped handle. That's what I mean by C-shaped. Because if we have a doorknob that we have to turn and we have arthritis, almost impossible. So changing your handles in your kitchen, and does that help with falls? Believe it or not, it does. Because in terms of having to turn things and getting agitated and moving things, I notice patients that come forward and say, I'm having a lot better with you know, handles that pull down versus handles that turn. I just can't get things open anymore. Readjusting our countertops is something that if you were to redesign your house for someone who's aging, I would change all the countertop heights because it's very difficult for, first of all, for as women or men to bend down and try and grab things. And adjusting the countertop back to a better work level actually prevents falls too because we're not losing our depth perception. We have better depth perception if the height is right there for us. Smoke alarms. And I know a lot of people say to me in, in sessions, well, I can't change the batteries. The fire department will come and change your batteries for free. So that's something to think about. And as well, certain times of the year, Home Depot will give away free smoke alarms to those that don't have them. Lower shelves, I alluded to this. You know, why do we have to have our pots and pans below the stove? Why do we not pare down our dishes and make our pots and our pans at eye height. Just a thought. And I didn't put this in here, but microwaves above our heads. So I just did one of my rotations in the burn center. And I would say 90% of our burns with over the age of 60 were in the kitchen as a result of hot liquids, boiling water, coffee, tea spilt on them because you get down into your chair and you spill hot coffee or tea onto yourself. And a majority of the burns are right here on the chest. And it, it's, to say that it looks painful is one thing, but to have to treat patients with these severe burns because of liquid spilling onto them from their microwave over top, it, it's, I can't even tell you the number of patients that we treated from September to December when I was there that had hot liquid spills. So this is really interesting in terms of temperature controlled cookware. Believe me, I do not work for Cuisinade, Rachel Ray, or Paula Dean. These are three that I've picked off that had very high ratings for temperature controlled cookware. And one of the reasons why I advocate for this is that patients with neuropathy can't necessarily feel the extreme hot or the extreme cold. And this type of cookware keeps us protected. I recommend this for families with young children as well. Again, if I had to tell you the number one burn in children, it was kitchen burns from liquids or from them touching the stove or the cookware alone. So just three of the brands that I found that were very highly rated. I've not tried them and nor do I work for these companies. I just don't wanna give anyone the impression that I'm getting a kickback, I do not. General modifications in the home, 26% of our falls occur because we don't have adequate lighting going to the bathroom. So pathway lights, I call them runway lights. I made my husband install runway lights down our hallway to their bathroom, just simply because my eyesight as I've grown older, I do not accommodate to the light as quickly as I used to. Toggle switches, which glow in the dark, are brilliant because you're not searching for the light switch, you see them. This is fairly common sense, and you see this in most homes nowadays, switches at both top and bottom of the stairs. That's something that's pretty common knowledge. And throw rugs drive me bananas because I trip on my own throw rugs. I know other people trip on their own throw rugs because we don't have the ability, it curls up, we don't have the ability to keep them down. So if people insist on them, 
and it's not a good look and people argue with me with this so i'll take duct tape and i will tape down the corners of the throw hooks i did this with my father years ago he was he was blind and you know in the in in his earlier years he could feel the rugs but as he grew older he couldn't so i taped down everything and i'm sure he hated me but it made me feel better and i didn't hear him you know tripping in the other room on the rugs benches and entryways so you can take your shoes on and off if you if you take your shoes off in the home are very handy rather than trying to slip your shoes on and then tripping and this is a really interesting idea illuminate your address outside so people can find you if you're in trouble i think that's a really practical solution that we don't have and i you know you either have your address on your mailbox or your sorry your number or at the front of the house and then all the lights are off at the front of the house and driving down the road trying to find people can be very difficult for EMS if in fact we don't have this all illuminated. So I, I do wanna to touch on evidence-based fall programs so that if you are looking for something to help you within your home, again, this is home-based, there's a program called Matter of Balance. And up until COVID times, this was a face-to-face -face interactive session. We wanted people to come to a senior center or to a hall where they interacted with others now they've made this online and they're rolling this out in the next two months and i know this because i'm part of this group as a master trainer so they're training us to do online sessions and i think this is something that will be very good for a lot of people because it is peer-to-peer -peer, as i discussed before having the ability to chat with someone else about what's going on sometimes what happens is you work out your own solutions within the group because people will say well, I don't carry my laundry up the stairs. I, I actually put my laundry upstairs or I bring it up in grocery bags or I throw it down the stairs. We've had many people fall and have severe neck injuries from carrying laundry baskets down the stairs. And when we talk about it, it was one of my seniors that said, I just throw it down the lot in a bag. I thought, brilliant, brilliant. You know, it, I might actually do that myself, but it helps. And in terms of matter of balance, they do have an exercise component here too. So you see the people in that little picture, they start about week three and they have evidence-based exercises, whether you're in the chair or whether you're standing. And they're all based on work from physiotherapists and evidence-based or tried exercises that help with your balance, but also help with movement and help to help with your core strength. It's called matter of balance, but be very careful. People often think that it's an exercise class, but it's a mix of exercise and it's a mix of talking through some of the things that help us fall. And again, keep your eyes out because this will be virtual coming soon. There is a program called Tai Chi. I think everyone's pretty much heard of Tai Chi and I cannot stress it enough. They have Tai Chi classes almost in every senior center now that are Zoom, they're free. And in fact, what I did was, uh, I'll show this next slide to you. But what I did was find programs around the country. So if you wanna do a screenshot of this or take a picture of this, but this is also taped. But in terms of finding Tai Chi programs, this is the overall morning movement, beginners, seniors, when you're short on time. Let me tell you something about Tai Chi. I'm going back to the slide here. You'll notice that everyone here has a foot forward. And Tai Chi, what it does is it helps you understand where your center of gravity is. And everyone here is taking a step forward. And what I often find is that when we fall down, we fall down and we go boom, uh, smack on our head or fall backwards, or we fall on our shoulders or our ribs. But you'll note here, every participant has their hand forward as well. I'd rather fix your hand than your head if you were to fall. And Tai Chi really gives people that feeling of, feeling more confident as they move forward, but also if you were to fall, you're naturally going to fall like this, we're noticing with some patients. So it's a great exercise. And it, I've gotta be honest with you, this has been studied worldwide. This is not you know, a fad, this has been around for many, many years. And the other thing that you'll notice is that the people are also have, some of them have their back foot up. And again, teaches you how to move forward. And it's very, very focused on keeping that core strength there for you. Again, this is the slide that I mentioned. They have Tai Chi for arthritis. I know that the Trumbull Senior Center has a Tai Chi for arthritis patients. 
And again, Tai Chi can be done in the chair or standing up. So just to give you an example of the efficacy or the, the greatness of this particular program, we brought this here to Bridgeport Hospital a number of years ago, and everyone was in the chair when they started. We had one senior gentleman that was unable to stand up without using the arms of his chair, or he could get up and walk, walk on his own, but it took him a couple of seconds. Within the eight weeks of doing this Tai Chi program, he started standing right up with the movements that Tai Chi gave him. And we also had a number success story in Norwalk where they were doing Tai Chi. And this elderly woman walked in to give us a review of how good it was. And before Tai Chi, she was unable to move her arm here. After Tai Chi, she showed us. She showed us her different flexibility. And she said, I cannot believe that I have so much flexibility after this program. And it is not about you know stretching out those muscles and making them yoga-like, but definitely helps you with movement. I alluded to after a fall occurs, and what do you do? Do you use your phone? Do you use your, what do you do? And I think it's important that if you've fallen, and I can't stress this enough, we have a number of patients that come in and tell us they've fallen four or five times. Check for injury. You may not know that there's an injury there. Look for bleeding, look for bruising, call for help. And if you've hit your head, it's really important that you do tell your doctor because Sometimes we find bleeds two or three days after a fall. So we want you to be safe and learn how to get up safely. I know that sounds trite, but get on all fours and use the furniture for help. And definitely, if you have the ability to hit your call safety alert buttons, please do so. It is not an embarrassment. In fact, if anything, to me, it's showing you know, yourself that you can do this and, and no EMS, no medical personnel will berate you for hitting your safety alert button. Interesting stuff to read. I know where they did a study through AARP, what do elders do? What do they want to do? And the number one thing that we're finding seniors doing is learning. It used to be gaming, interestingly enough, like bingo and games on, on their iPads. And what we're finding in the last year is learning, which is phenomenal to me because this generation is becoming more techie and they're becoming more savvy. But interesting sites, these are just the names of blogs, not AARP, but this Caring Home, Elder Chicks, Times Go By, Senior Planet. And the Upside to Aging had a really interesting link to chair yoga for those of you that are interested. Again, yoga, another great exercise, help with, helps with core strength and balance. And some interesting books, if you're interested in reading a little bit more. I've read all three, and all three are absolutely amazing. The Art of Aging, doctor's prescription for well-being being mortal at Gawande, he is amazing we've all read this in the hospital as as understanding from the patient perspective what it what matters to our patients and the force of character and lasting life by james hillman all three fantastic reads so nothing is impossible the word itself says i am possible so for those of you that are saying well what was practical here what can i do to you know decrease my chances of falling again medically Look around and say to yourself, what are my meds doing to me? Am I sitting too much? Do I need to exercise? Do I need to drink more water? Do I need to be more mindful of infections? And again, environmentally, have a look at your home. The AARP, I'm not affiliated, has a beautiful, beautiful book that they publish. I cannot publish anything quite as, as, as amazing as this. It's a, not cartoon, but it's a pictorial of different things to look at in your home in terms of redesigning your home. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm not sure how many people heard this or will hear this, but I do appreciate you listening. And if anyone has any questions, please chat. No questions. <laughs> So Lisa, if you're still here, if you could unmute yourself, because I think we are done. It doesn't appear to have any questions. Okay, then I will stop recording and uh, I can end the meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks for falls. Is there any scenario where you wouldn't call 911? Oh, great question. Great question. So that I think that if I get into giving you the scenarios, uh, it might put me into litigious problems of telling people not to call 911. But to be to be brief, if if you're if you're not injured and it was a very low velocity fall, so basically you bent down on one knee and you're able to ambulate, you have no pain, 
you don't feel confused. Although, how would you know that you're feeling confused? I think, I think if you truly are walking, talking, feeling fine, then that would be an answer to no, you don't need 911. But if you're worried, yes, yes, absolutely. And I think we have a lot of patients that ignore what's going on. I feel fine. I'm good. I'm good. It's not that bad. I'm going to, I'll be fine in a couple hours. As soon as I lay down for a couple hours. To me, that's a warning bell. If you're thinking that you need to lie down, you need to call 911. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. So the other question that we have here is why do nursing homes keep people in wheelchairs? Now, do you mean wheelchairs like out in the hallway or, or you mean jerry chairs that people are in? I'm assuming that's what that means. That we have jerry chairs in nursing homes or we leave them in the chair. Do you mean all day or for a couple of hours? Excuse me, I think one of the things that we need to really, really concentrate on in long-term care facilities and, and in general, and I've, I've said this in this presentation, is exercise. We do not have the resources in nursing homes that we need to get people up and moving three, four times a day. You know, simply sitting them in a chair for eight hours is detrimental to their health. It, again, we're not we're not asking people to go to the bathroom. They're certainly not watering themselves because how could they drink and not go to the bathroom? And that's a question that I've had for years as well. Why are we leaving our elders more sedate? Why are we not moving them around more? And I, I'm not really sure the wheelchair, why people are left in wheelchairs in a nursing home. I'd, if, I found, if I was in a nursing home administrator and found people in a wheelchair for eight hours, I'd probably lose my mind. But we do like to get people up and you know, years ago, if you had pneumonia, laid in bed all day, or if you had a hip fracture, you were in bed for two or three days before we have you moving. We literally have you out of bed that night if you have had hip surgery. We know that leaving people in bed all day predisposes to pneumonia specifically. So getting people up, even if it's in a chair, gets things moving. So I'm not sure that answers your question, Linda, but that might account for why they're trying to get them up into chairs is just to have them mobile to a point. Did that answer your question? I believe there is a recording of this presentation. I'm not sure if it will be posted on the Greenwich website. Uh, Lisa, can you answer that question? Yes, it's being recorded. Yes, it's being recorded. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, there you have it. I think we're done, Lisa and Linda and Brian and to anyone else who listens to this, I thank you very much. Thank you for coming.